In the Hebrew Bible, interestingly, the theme of the image of God can be found only and exclusively in the book of Genesis. It does not appear in any other of the other books of scripture. And, you know, this is a question uh, one has to wonder why, why what is the, the reason. Then uh, you know that in scripture there are a number of books which are written in Greek. They are called um, deuter deuterocanonical. So deuteros means second. Uh, so they've been acknowledged as, as part of scripture only later. And not everyone uh, thinks that they are part of scripture. There's the book of wisdom. Um, there's the book of Proverbs, I think. There, is, um, there are a number of other books. Um, um, but these books, interestingly, written later and uh, which are written in Greek have the theme of the image of God. So there are a number of passages from the book of wisdom, uh, the book of Sirach and the book of Ezra, the second book of Ezra in which the theme of image appears, but very, very lightly. And then in the New Testament, on the contrary, it's pervasive. You find it uh, absolutely everywhere. And it is used to say both that for Jesus Christ, he is the image of the Father, and we are in the image of God, and this image has to undergo a transformation, and we're going to talk about this in a moment. So, but the thing which I, I, uh, I'm in number five in the handout now, so the thing which I, I you know, want to attract your attention on is the fact that this is present only in the book of Genesis, only in the book of Genesis. Now, when it comes to, uh, I attracted your attention last week on the fact that we have two versions of scripture in chapter one uh, of, of creation in the book of Genesis, in chapter one and chapter two, and they do not match. They have a different approach. In the first one, God creates by his word, in the second history of creation, God, God is presented more like an artisan who um, um, kind of shapes, fashions human beings out of the uh, earth. The, for a long time, there's been this idea that uh, the book of Genesis and most of the Old Testament was the product of four literary traditions, okay? Uh, it is called the documentary theory. You find it in number five. Uh, and um, these traditions, for instance, they notice that why sometimes God is called Yahweh, why other times it's called Elohim. Uh, so they thought, okay, each time it's called Yahweh, it, it is because it is one literary tradition. Each time it's called Elohim is because it is another um, a tradition. Um, and, and so, um, for a long time, there was this idea that there are four literary sources. You find them here by the letter G-E-D-P. So the Yavist or Jerusalem source, the Elohim, Eloist source, the Deuteronomist source, and the priestly source. Now, this theory is not uh, accepted universally anymore. A lot of exegetes are really questioning it. Um, so I don't, I personally, I, I think, I think is a bit too neat as a theory to account for the complexity of the Old Testament. Uh, but it is certain that there are different traditions, different texts, different um, um, mentalities which have converged, which have been put together. Uh, and again, last time I attracted your attention on the fact that those who put together the scriptures, we know now, we know it now, didn't feel the need to harmonize those. Uh, didn't, didn't say, oh, here, uh, you know, um, what is said here contradicts what is being said in this other passage. Mm -hmm. So we should, we should really kind of even um, these um, uh, versions. Well, they didn't do it. They are comfortable, they were comfortable with having different versions of the same event and sometimes contradicting each other. Same thing for the New Testament. We have four versions of what, you know, what can be called the history of Jesus, the four Gospels. And especially, let's say, when it comes to the um, history of the resurrection, the resurrection narrative, they contradict each other. Okay, so the people who say um, that, you know, we just should read scripture and that's all, we should take the letter of scripture, that's the norm. Well, the letter of scripture is contradictory uh, in many, many uh, passages. Um, and it is never, scripture has never been written to be read literally in that way. 
scripture has always been written to be interpreted. And this is why you have contrasting versions so that you have to make a decision uh, or you have to see, well, what is this version telling me about the event and what is this other version telling me about the event? So in the instance here, we have the same phenomenon for the book of, um, of Genesis. And when it comes to the theme of the image of God, and this is a point I wanted to get to, um, it comes from what is called the priestly source. The number, um, so in uh, number, um, number five, five, four, the priestly source, um, which is characterized, I mean, which was, uh, I, I mentioned several times to you the exile. So when uh, Jerusalem was conquered by Babylon, most of the population was um, shipped to Babylon. The temple was destroyed. There was no king anymore. Uh, there was no um, holy land because they were in exile. So huge crisis. And during that crisis, you have a group of priests who uh, could not sacrifice anymore, could not offer sacrifices to God anymore because the only place in the Old Testament in which you could offer sacrifices was in the temple of Jerusalem. So they had to find other ways of keeping alive the tradition. And there, the focus went from sacrifices to the book, the book, okay, and became the source of the um, uh, what is has become Judaism, especially after the destruction, the last destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem in 70 after Christ. So um, the focus is on the book, and uh, they they put together all these different traditions, and they wrote the book of uh, you know among other things the book of Genesis. So the book of Genesis we know it. And the, the Pentateuch, so the first five books of scripture, were put together uh, in the um, sixth, or fifth or sixth century before Christ during the exile. Now, the interesting thing is that the, <clears throat> uh, at the same time, or slightly earlier than that, there was the uh, prophetic tradition. So the prophets, we you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc., but especially the prophet Isaiah is very interesting, and especially the second half of the book of the prophet Isaiah. So Isaiah, you know, is, is one book for us, 55 chapters, etc. But in reality, uh, there are two Isaiahs. It's very clear that from chapter four onwards, we have to, um, we could probably like we'd say uh, uh, first book of Kings, second book of Kings, we should say first book of Isaiah, second book of Isaiah, the Deutero Isaiah. And this Deutero Isaiah um, had a lot of influence on these priests when they were putting together the book of Genesis as we know it and um, come, um, kind of formulating this idea of the image of God. The Deutero Isaiah, has an emphasis on creation. I mean, six in the handout. Also, is uh, this this uh, second book of Isaiah is is where Israel realizes that God is not just is not calling us to save us alone, but is calling us to sa to save the whole world um, through us. Uh, through us, God does not just want to save Israel; wants to save the whole world is the God of the whole world. So you can imagine that at the moment in which they realize that this God is the God of the whole world, they start thinking, okay, so he must be at the origin of this whole world. Uh, and, um, and instead of focusing on Abraham as the ancestor, so up to that moment, roughly speaking, the, the first in the line was Abraham, uh, from that moment onwards, there is another one before or above, which is Adam, because Abraham was only the father of Israel, whereas Adam and Eve were the progenitors of the whole of humanity. And the project of God is not just on Abraham, but is on Adam and Eve. The blessing, you know, you know the, the beginning of the story of Israel is with the blessing to Abraham. I bless you and your descendants, and through your descendants, I bless all the nations of the earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that blessing is given to Adam and Eve in the beginning of the book of Genesis. So, uh, the, um, the, the, this uh, Deuteronomy Isaiah 
insisting on creation, insisting on the universality of salvation, with a strong monotheism. Uh, Israel has always believed in one God, and yet at the same time, um, it did not mean that for them there were not other gods, only that God was the strongest or the most powerful of all the gods. Whereas with the uh, Deutero Isaiah, there is really this sense that there are no other gods. There is only the God of Israel. So a very strong monotheism. And the other element which is developed through the second Isaiah is also a, an incredibly forceful and strong polemic against idolatry, against idolatry, because idolatry was still practiced by the people of Israel. They still, they had the temple in Jerusalem, but they had also other little temples or other little places of worship. And, you know, and they were a bit of a, you know, they, they tended to be syncretists when it came to uh, their religiosity. And this is why um, the insistence of the prophets, in particular the Deuter Isaiah, against idolatry, against graven images. So against the tendency of making images of God. Okay. And here we reach the point where uh, the prophet says constantly, we cannot have any image of God. There is nothing that can image God uh, because God is invisible, because God is all powerful, because God is infinitely uh, greater than everything which exists because God has created everything, because in God we live and exist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So nothing, we cannot have any, any, any image of God. And there is this sentence uh, in number seven in your handout uh, from the book of Isaiah, the Deuteronomy Isaiah, chapter 40, 40, 18, in which Isaiah says, with whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? Now imagine this is the question, okay? Um, we don't need an image of God. And yet, in the thinking, in the prayerful kind of reflection of these priests, uh, grows the sense that, well, actually, no, there is an image of God. There is a way in which, uh, or there is a sense in which God has uh, left in creation something that is more like him than anything else. And what is this? This is the human being. So, number eight, the authors of Genesis 1 seem to have tried to give an answer to this very question. Human beings are described as having a special role in a very organized vision of the world and or, or the cosmos, which is the organized um, world. And here we have that sentence, which I quoted to you earlier, let us make human beings in our image after our uh, likeness and let them have dominion let have let them have dominion now we talked about this dominion last time and i'm going to go back to this in a moment but it seems that uh in what does this image uh consist of what does this image consist it is this power over creation, the fact that everything is entrusted uh, is entrusted to um, to them, and this seems to be confirmed by Psalm eight, uh, one of one of the very beautiful psalms um, of the Book of Psalms. Uh, you know it very well, number eight one uh, in your handout, page four. Lord our God, how majestic, how glorious is your name in all the earth! You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies the, to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, you see, that's the same mentality which is behind the creation in the first book of Genesis. God that established the stars, the heavens, etc., etc., so when I see all this, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put to, uh, everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, 
So you see, again, the uh, lists of animals and um, um, we find in the book of Genesis and the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This psalm is incredibly important, uh, incredibly important because it is this psalm that really explains what dominion uh, means. So um, we um, we have here the first of, um, of I, I could list more, but the first of three uh, clusters of interpretations of what the image of God. Uh, the first one, what the image of God is. And the first one is the functional. It's called the functional interpretation of the image of God. Number nine in your handout. The image of God consists in human dominion over the animals. It is attached to humanity and humanity only. The animals don't have it, don't have the image of God. It is reinforced in Genesis 9, where the killing of animals is sanctioned, is authorized, but the killing of humans is to be punished expressly because God has made humanity in his own image. This is the quotation from Genesis 9, 6. One who spills the blood of a human being through by a human being, um, his blood will be spilled, for in God's image, he made um, them. Now, uh, this has been, of course, very problematic because it seems to have uh, sanctioned the exploita exploitation uh, of creation of, of animals uh, by, uh, by, by humanity. Um, and um, uh, of course, this is you know now we realize how huge a problem it is. So there is this sense, oh, uh, this is the mentality, uh, the idea that we have dominion over over power, over creation, so we can do a bit whatever we want, uh, so we can even destroy it. Uh, we don't have to have any respect for it. But saying this is really mistaking entirely uh, what nature says because. When, whenever scripture talks about power and dominion, it doesn't talk about power and dominion as we understand it as human beings, but as uh, the power and dominion God exercises. How does God exercise his power? Is by living, is by, by loving, it is by caring, it is by taking responsibility. So that dominion here does not mean absolute power, so I can do a bit whatever I want. But dominion means, um, one of the aspects of dominions, which is very interesting in the book of Genesis, is naming the animals, uh, giving them a name, uh, which means I have to know them, which means I have to recognize the gift which is in, in each one uh, of them, uh, which means I have to respond to them. So uh, dominion here means, means really um, stewardship, means care, but means even more than that. Uh, human beings um, are placed, are the only ones who can realize, have the ability to realize that everything that exists is a gift. And so the responsibility of human beings is uh, take responsibility of this gift, like the talents in the book, uh, in the gospels. And it is also give thanks for everything which has been given to us. So uh, human beings are placed somehow at the point of conjunction between creation and, and God. They recognize that everything is given by God and they give thanks to God for all these gifts. And the, all this is included in the notion of dominion. And uh, why we know it, we know it just by going back to the Psalm 8, which I just quoted to you, because the Psalm 8, uh, is all about how majestic is God, how wonderful is God. It's all about uh, worshiping God, uh, thank, giving thanks to him, acknowledging uh, how much everything is, um, is a gift from him, and we want to praise God for everything he has given to us. So, in line, though, with this sense that uh, what is this image of God is uh, God having placed us, having given us the ability to recognize that everything is a gift, that we have to administer everything responsibly and give thanks for this. 
means that we need to understand it. Uh, and uh, only human beings are capable of this process of understanding. So, uh, and I am in number nine four now, the contrast with the animals was very probably a force that propelled the theme of the image of God with great ease into the intellectual area. So how did human beings dominate the animals? Not by sheer strength, for the animals had the advantage in strength, in speed, in adaptation to their environment. Human domination, in inverted commas, rests upon the use of technology, and technology rests upon human powers of thought, reason, language, and abstraction. Language and abstraction. So um, what is in us that it is like God? Uh, it seems to be um, our reason, uh, our rational um, aspect. This is, incidentally, what um, we find in the other passages on the image of God in the Greek uh, books of the New Testament. So here there is a quotation from the book uh, Wisdom of Solomon, number 11, where you find that um, you know, starts by the Lord created human beings of the earth, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then he says, made them according to his image, so we find the theme of the image of God, and what is that makes them in the image of God, a bit further down, uh, a mind for thinking he gave them, he filled with knowledge, filled them with knowledge and understanding, and show them good and evil. So, uh, first cluster of themes to interpret the, the, the image of God is the functional one, the one that, in, that kind of stresses the domination over uh, animals or the responsibility over creation, the stewardship of creation. Second cluster of meanings, number 12, is, uh, is the spiritual or rational. The image of God is related to the spiritual rational character of humanity, which distinguishes uh, distinguish it from the, the animal uh, world. Um, and at one point in number 12, um, there is this sense that, oh, well, so how do we know God? Um, for most of the history of uh, Israel and Christianity, people answered, well, there is only way, one way to know God is if God makes himself known to us. So if he speaks to us, either directly with visions or, uh, or indirectly, as uh, it is most of the time the case, through the prophets. But if God does not talk to us, does not reveal himself to us, we cannot know him. And then, you know, uh, starting from this theme of the image of God, people started to think, oh, well, if we are creating the image of God, there must be in us something which is like God. This something is, the, is our reason, is our reason, which is in Greek is called logos. Okay. Uh, and um, it's logos in Greek. Um, is, this is the um, translation. And logos means, uh, means uh, reason, means word, uh, but also is the principle that um, um, explains why the world makes sense. So in, in other ways, I mean, is the phenomenon we find together uh, in the relationship between physics and mathematics? Uh, is that we discover things about the physical world first through mathematics, uh, and then we find that by, uh, you know, when we are able to experiment, to do the experiments we need to do, we find that they correspond to uh, the physical world. So it means that there is in us something which is able to understand how the world, the world, the universe works, which means that there is the same mind, you see, the same mind that created the whole of the universe is the mind that created us. Um, so there is this idea that the universe is, is uh, coherent, is rational, because it is organized by a logos, a mind or a reason, let's say the reason of God. Uh, and we have in us a, a kind of a, a, an image or a, a little bit of the logos. Um, and, and this is what the image of God is. But this also means that 
then uh, if we want to know God, we just have to go inside ourselves. So instead of going outside ourselves in scripture, we go inside ourselves, we look at what it is to be reasonable, rational, rational human beings, and this is the way we know God. Um, so this created two, almost a two-way system to know God. There is the knowledge of God through scripture, and there is knowledge of God through looking inside ourselves, which gave rise to um, all sorts of mystical traditions, etc. This is the interpretation which is called the point of context. So what I told you is explained in number 13 in this um, handout. Um, and I'm in number 14 now. So this interpretation of the image of God as a point of contact. So uh, mm. between us and God, uh, there is a point of contact, which is our reason. Well, it's difficult to square, as I told you earlier, with the way in which God reveals himself in scripture. Scripture, and especially the prophets, states categorically that the initiative of revelation belongs to God alone. It does not uh, if he does not reveal himself, we have no way of knowing him. And again, here we have a passage from the Deuter Isaiah, um, chapter 45, verse, verse 15. Truly, you are a God who has been hiding himself, the God and Savior of Israel. Hmm? So, is a hidden God. God is a hidden God. And unless he reveals himself, we cannot uh, know him. And 14.2, the only way God reveals himself is in the history of the people uh, he has chosen. He speaks to them and expects a response from them. And I gave you here a lovely uh, quotation by a German philosopher called Martin Buber. You can read by yourself um, afterwards. So this idea that, um, and you know, I, um, for, for instance, for the doctrine of Trinity, um, St. Augustine, St. Augustine, uh, developed a whole kind of system whereby he said, well, um, how do we know things? How do we know reality? And he said, well, uh, I would not even start inquiring about something unless I was attracted by it, unless I was interested in it. So he said, when knowledge and love are inseparable, I will never... Uh, uh, undertake a process of knowing something unless I was attracted to this thing. So knowledge and love are the same thing. And then I can know only to the extent that I retain what I learn. So memory is also essential. So he said, you know, in all in the process of knowledge, there is, uh, there is uh, memory, knowledge, and uh, 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 understanding. These are three things, but there is just one mind. And he said, okay, this is the image of God in us that you know, the, these three kind of aspects of the process of knowledge, which is knowledge, love, and memory, are three things, but the act of knowledge is one. So it, just to give you an example, this has been immensely popular in the history of Christian thought. The reality is that uh, even Augustine actually was doing something else uh, when he uh, devised this analogy, as it's called analogy. Um, and um, the reality is that the image of God is not done for this. It's not meant to be an autonomous way of having access to God, independent from, uh, from scripture, independent mm. from history. So what is this image of God? Uh, and I reach now the third, the third kind of class of meanings, which the one I, um, I believe is uh, closer to, um, to what the image of God really means. So the first one was the functional one. Uh, which insists on the domination and the stewardship over creation. The second one is the one that insists on reason. It is reason that in, his, in us is the image of, uh, of God. Uh, the third one, a third one, interestingly, uh, you find it in number 15, is um, one that insists on the ability to be in relation with God. The difference between human beings, I'm reading in number 15 now, the difference between human beings and God can be infinite, and it is infinite in many ways, and yet we are created to be in relation with God, to be able to worship him, to listen and to respond to him. The first thing God does 
when he creates human beings, he talks with them. He talks with us. And uh, even more than that, he comes to walk with us in the cool of the night, which is an image to explain that God does not want just to talk to us from above by giving us rules and laws, but wants to have a relationship which um, could be described as relation of friendship, as a relation of covenant, as a relation of love. Uh, so even if we, we are not equal to God, because obviously he's the creator and we are the creatures, he wants a relation which is, uh, um, which is a relation of complementarity, which is a relation on the same, on the same level. Even more, he, <laughs> he, he put himself below us uh, in Christ by dying you know, on the cross, et cetera, et cetera, so that we, he could persuade us of the extent to which he does not want to patronize us, but wants to be in a relation with us. So the ability to be in relation with God, which is something unheard of in terms of um, uh, religiosity uh, in the world. The, the, the great originality of the um, uh, biblical, the, uh, the Jewish uh, spirituality, and this is why it had such a huge impact as soon as it started to spread, was that it was proposing something unheard of, a God who does not just want to dominate us, control us, tell us what to do from above, but a God who wants to be in relation with us. And some of the references in number 16, some of the references to the image of God in the New Testament point in this direction. Um, there are these three passages, because those whom God has known, foreknown, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, says um, Romans. And then Corinthians says, we are being transformed into the image of God. We are being transformed. You see, it's not the image of God is not something which we have received once for all is there. And um, uh, but it's something which grows, something through which we are transformed, something through which we are conformed to God. And the last one, which is very interesting, Colossians 3.10 uh, and have put, we have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image that created him. So uh, the source of renewal is the fact that we are in the image of God. The source of renewal for us is the fact that we are able to be in a relationship with God. So number 17, the image of God in these verses appears as something through which we are conformed, transformed, and renewed. So at the beginning, one can almost say it is a potential, and it grows as we know and love God more and more, that is, as we grow in relationship with God, hmm? as we grow in relationship with God. So if you go to number 19, there is a passage I wanted to put to you last time, uh, last Sunday, but I couldn't, I didn't have enough time. So I, I put these passages here again, because they apply just as well to the whole of creation as to the creation in the image of God. So 19, there is a sense in which the image of God is more like a yearning, is more like a yearning. You know, God has created us with a yearning, a desire something which sets us in motion and prevents us from finding satisfaction in anything other than God himself. To be created in the image of God is almost like a curse. I mean, you know, in, in, in uh, exaggerating things and being slightly, uh, is that, you know, there is no way you are going to find anything. So this creation is all for you. Uh, I want you to enjoy it, to fructify, to multiply, et cetera, et cetera. This is all very good, but there's nothing here that will satisfy you entirely because you are creating my image. So only the relationship with me uh, is going to uh, give you what you want most. So I should have said probably more than a yearning is almost a, a sense in which it is a curse. Uh, we can't find rest until we rest in God. And here comes uh, obviously the beautiful, beautiful imagery of um, St. Augustine in the Confessions, these very, very, very famous passages, one at the beginning of the Confessions, the other one at the end of the Confessions in number 20. You have made us for yourself, God, and our heart is restless 
until it rests on you. Mm -hmm. You have made us for yourself. Being made for yourself, this is the image of God. We have been made for God, and we cannot find a peace other than in God. And the restlessness is not anxiety. Huh? It's, not, it's not that we are, we are sad, we are, we are uh, depressed, or we are, it's not this. Restlessness is what keeps us in motion. I mean, if we were not restless, we would you know, sit in bed or stay in bed the whole day. Something you know, take, gets us out of bed because we want, not only we have to do things, you know, we have to earn money, otherwise we can't eat, but also we want to do things. Uh, so it's a blessed restlessness is the one that, you know, uh, pushes us, pushes us to go. And, and then there is this other passage at the end of the uh, book of, um, of, um, of the Confessions, uh, which says, which uses this image, uh, my weight is my love. Mm? So it says, things which are not in their intended place are restless. Okay, in this world, this is our world, we have stewardship of it, we have to uh, uh, govern it responsibly, we have to do our best, we have to fructify our talents, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is not a final place. Hmm? It's a place which, um, which will grow with us into something else for which we are destined. So if you are restless, it's just because um, we start from here, but we are destined to go somewhere else. We start with this, but all this is going to be transformed. It's going to become a new creation. So once they are in their ordered place, they are at rest. Hmm? And then he says, my weight is my love. Where, wherever I'm carried, my love is carrying. So Augustine is using here a bit the idea of gravity. Uh, our weight is that which brings us down because of the force of gravity. And when it comes to the spiritually, uh, the weight is that which brings us where we are supposed to be. So we are, in a sense, subjected to two different forces of gravity. There is the physical gravity that brings us down, but there is the spiritual gravity which, uh, which attracts us towards, um, towards God. And uh, just as there is a weight that brings us down, so there is another kind of weight that uh, brings us towards God, and this weight is love. Wherever I am carried, my love is carried, carrying, um, carrying me. I find this passage really, really very beautiful. So 21, last page, number nine, we can interpret, interpret being made in the image of God as being made for God. And restlessness here, as I told you earlier, does not mean anxiety but search for the place where we belong, where we belong. And that which brings us to our intended place, the place for which we are created, is our weight, which is not just that which brings us down by gravity, but that which pulls us towards the place we are supposed to be. And this is a vision of created reality as moved by a universal desire, which in human beings takes the form of love and knowledge. Hence the sense, my weight is my love. So I think that this at least makes sense for me when I try to understand what does God or does Genesis mean when it talks about being created in the image of God is being created with a possibility to be in relationship with God, but also a yearning, a desire, uh, a curse almost, um, whereby we 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 cannot find any, uh, any, any fullness of meaning or any, we cannot flourish, flourish to, to what we are supposed to be. We cannot become what are supposed to be unless we uh, um, invest, if you want, in this relationship with God through knowing him, through loving him, um, and through loving each other. That's, that's a bit the, um, you know, the, the overall meeting, meaning of the image of God in Scripture. Shall we say a little prayer to, to end? And we can take the words of Psalm 8. I quoted to you earlier. What is 
mankind, that you're mindful of them, human beings, that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen.